services a number of weeks ago. We preached uh, just from the first verse, and today we're just going to look at verse 2. In Genesis, I'll read verse 1 and 2, but I want to zoom in on verse 2. Of course, this is Moses, the writings of Moses. He wrote the first five books of scriptures. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There was no beginning with God. God is infinite. But he says in the beginning, this was a time period. And the earth was without form. And void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face <coughs> of the waters. The infallible and earth indestructible, eternal, heaven-sent, precious word of God, which is settled in heaven, explains that creation is attributed to God the Father, Acts chapter 4, to God the Son, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God, and by the Word all things were created, and also God the Holy Spirit, Psalm 104, verse 30. Moses does not go into great detail on how God created this universe because it is so obvious in general revelation that there is a supreme being, a great infinite creator who created this universe and sustains it in perfect harmony as the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. You look up and you see the vastness of the heavens. You should know automatically we have been built in. Our conscience should tell us that there is a God out there, a great creator. And man is without an excuse as he looks up vertical, but also horizontal. And he looks around him, seeing the mountains, seeing the valleys, seeing the oceans, the seas, the lakes, the rivers, the different seasons, the trees, the grass, the animal kingdom. Mankind, the stars, the sun, the moon, and only a fool who would say there is no God out there. Just look around you, it's so obvious there is an infinite creator, an infinite designer. The psalmist reminds us twice in Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 or so the fool saith there is no God. They deliberately hardened their heart in rebellion. It is so obvious. It is not up for question or debate. Every person in the world should know there is a supreme being, a great infinite creator. As he has created this universe, how he sustains it, and how he makes everything to work in perfect harmony. If God took his hand of this universe, it would be obliterated in a split second. As well as our past finding out, of course, we are so limited, we are so finite, but God in his glorious mercy has given us his revelation through his word. General revelation, we should know there's a creator when we look up in the heavens and we look around us, all around us, the creation, but God in a special revelation in which he has spoken in these last days, referring to the ascension of Jesus Christ almost 2,000 years ago, right until the return of Jesus Christ, God has spoken through him, in which through this special revelation known as the Word of God, the Old and the New Testament, which consists of 66 books, God has spoken, which points to Jesus Christ in these last days, that there's a Saviour, that there's a Deliverer, that there is one who has come to reconcile us back to God. God has given us his book. What special treasure it is. No one is the Lord's counselor. God does not need instruction 
or a help from anybody. His ways are past finding out. Who is the Lord's counselor? As he stretches forth the heavens like a curtain and has made the seas in the hollow of his hand. Even places in Jeremiah tells us the thing of the grip, the, the power of the sea and the ocean, and how he just puts a hand, it says, a, a little beach, we call it, of sand, a wee strip of sand, and how incredibly this great ocean, the power of it, this great sea, doesn't even go past it. As Isaiah, the great chapter, Isaiah 40 says, in the magnificent and splendor of God and the greatness and the power of God and his infinite wisdom says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the eternal God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increase of strength. What a portion of scripture. God is everlasting. There's no escape, folks. We will all stand before our Creator. And who is going to judge us? The Lord Jesus Christ. Judgment is given over to Christ. If you're saved, praise God, you're not to judge because of your sin. It's been dealt with 3,000 years ago. Your judicial standing is clean, is right. Before God, Christ has dealt with our sin, but God's people will be judged referring to how faithful we have been because we're not our own, we're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. How faithful we have been to God, how we have served Him, while we have lived a consistent holy life to bring glory to His name. You see, God is the everlasting God, there's no escape. But then the other side is, is the sinners, the rebellious sinners who have never repented, who are still in their sin, still holding on to their sin, and they will be resurrected to the great white throne judgment. There is no escape. And there's no mercy. And there's no grace. And they'll be cast into the everlasting lake of fire, lost forever. In that horrendous, horrible place called hell. You see, God is the everlasting God. And every single one of us is accountable to him. Excuse me. <coughs> He's a creator of the ends of the earth. Isaiah tells us. He faints not. God never gets weary or tired. We get tired. We do a hard day's work. We can't wait to get to bed that evening. God never slumbers or sleeps. There's no search in his understanding. God never needs to be, needs a counselor. He never needs anyone to give him instruction. He is perfect in wisdom and knowledge. And he is the one who gives power to the faith and so forth. Someone said scripture does not reveal why God chose to start his creative work with the chaotic mass that was dark, formless and empty. But the Holy Spirit brooding over the waters would bring order out of chaos and beauty and fullness out of emptiness. And this is what happened in verse 2 of our verse today, our text today. The Holy Spirit, something which was empty, but the Holy Spirit would brood over the waters and would bring order out of chaos and beauty and fullness out of emptiness. Because the earth was without form at that time. And as we zoom in here in this great verse, in verse 2, it tells us here that the earth was. And the earth was in the very beginning of this verse, and the earth was. Notice here as this is very significant. On the earth was. Why is it very significant? Because at the beginning of every single verse in this chapter, Apart from verse 1, every single verse, if you read down there, just look verse 3, on, on it says, verse 4, on, verse 15, on, it just keeps going on, 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 verse right to the last verse, 31, on God. So this is very significant, it says, on the earth was, 
Every verse, every verse, apart from verse 1, it says, and, in the remaining 30 verses of this chapter, which tells us something. You see, each verse starts with, and. Why does it do that? It indicates to us that this structure, chronologically, <laughs> connects all these verses before and after giving an action flowing directly describing the verse preceding it. They're all connected. It's one discourse. This pattern gives no room for a chronological gap called the gap theory. As the context speaks of day one, 24 hour period, evening and morning. We're well acquainted. A lot of you have been living a lot longer than me and this earth. We're all acquainted that evening and the morning is a 24 hour period. And it goes right through evening and the morning, right to verse 31, the 24 hour period. This word on is all connected in one discourse. One context. It says here, and the earth was without form. In verse 2a. And the earth was without form. This does not mean the earth did not have any shape as yet, but rather it did not reflect design. There was substance, but not staying. In a sense, it was like a pile of timber or blocks not compiled together into a building of a house or a lump of clay not yet put on a potter's wheel to be designed into something useful. And the Jeremiah reminds us God is the potter, we are the clay, and God is shaping us and molding us and transforming us, shaping us and conforming us into the image of Christ that we will be useful, effective believers for his glory. This lack of form design would be manifested completely in two, day two and day three of the creation procedure. The earth at this stage was unfilled. It was void, it says in verse two, it was unfilled. And the earth was without form and void. It was unfilled. It wasn't shaped. The earth was empty of anything of inhabitants. But by day six in the creation process, the earth would be filled and commanded to go forth and multiply. In verse 28, it tells us here, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, As Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the earth, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. At this stage, there was no inhabitants. It wasn't unfilled. At this point, the physical universe, though created, was not energized as light is a form of energy. Doesn't the sun give us energy? The plants and everything. It was unilluminated in total darkness. The text tells us, without one speck of light, verse 2b, and the earth was without form. It was shapeless. It was unfulfilled, unfilled even, in a void it says, and darkness was upon the face of the day. It was unilluminated. There wasn't one speck of light in it. It was still incomplete. But God brought light, illumination to the earth in day one and day four. Verse three it says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 14, it tells us here, referring to day four. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, stars, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, of course, which is the sun and the moon, the 
greater light is to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night, he made the stars also. And God sat down in the firmament of the heaven that gave light upon the earth. In the spiritual context, this fallen, corrupt, polluted, dark world we live in is flooded and governed with the prince of darkness. The world laugh and evil, John reminds us. This is why trouble was never too far away. Disasters. Last night, I'm sure some of you have heard that tragedy, 151 was them killed in that crush. Trouble is never too far away. There's always catastrophes. Because we're in a fallen world, we're in a sinful world, we're in a painful world, we're in a corrupt world, we're in an evil world. But praise God, who is light, who is holy, who is perfection, sent the one who is the light of the world. The blessed, glorious Lord Jesus Christ, the only Saviour, to deliver sinners out of darkness, Satan's kingdom, and translate them into God's marvellous light, Christ's kingdom. I wonder this afternoon, are you in Christ's kingdom? Have you had assurance? Has there been a time that you've truly repented and received Christ as Saviour? I wonder, are you walking in the light? God's people truly with preached in this at different times. To know a true Christian, they walk in the light consistently. Times we do fall, but we get up again and we consistently walk in the light. I wonder, are you walking in the light? Are you part of Christ's kingdom, saved, sins forgiven, sins purged, knowing not assured you're going to glory? Because, folks, there's coming a time we're all going to die. Death is an appointment. Yesterday, Sunday, you got put that on your news, 151 has died. It's an accident in the world's eyes, but from God's perspective, it was an appointment. Are you walking in the light? Are you prepared for death? You see, death is no pull over the believer. We go immediately into the presence of the Lord, and the Lord takes the servants, his children home. Blessed are they who die in the Lord. The Lord has great delight in the death of the saints. Are you walking in the light? Are you part of Christ's kingdom? Showing forth the praises of the living God by being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ by bringing glory to his name. But at the end of the verse 2 here, we can discover the curing for the original creation here. The curing for the original creation. As much cheering protection was given to the original creation. And verse 2 it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God is at is is work here. The Spirit of God is hovering, moving across upon the face of the waters. The cheering for the creation here. This informs us by Moses regarding the third person, the Godhead, who is the Holy Spirit. Trinity again, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Although this marvelous universe had been called into existence by the omnipotent, almighty Creator, God the Father, the universe had not yet been inspired, permeated with energy, as sat or sat in motion until the energizing action of the Spirit of God moved and activated in power in verse 2 C. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God moved in energizing power, activating power. As the Spirit of God is God. Third person in the Godhead. The Spirit of God is omnipresent. He is the energizer who sets in motion all things. Being the living God who can and which we cannot exist without Him. As in Him we live and move and have our very being. Our breath is in His hand. The verse explains that the Spirit of God moved. 
in which this verb moved in the old in the Old Testament, it's only mentioned three times and it's translated fluttered in Deuteronomy and Sheikh and Jeremiah. It gives us a picture of an eagle, of an eagle moving over its young by protecting them. And today, dear friends, it gives God's people great comfort. Just the way an eagle flutters over the young to protect them. It gives God's people great comfort, great assurance, great encouragement that God protects, provides and cures for his people with an everlasting love, knowing that he will bring us to glory. Jesus said even to the disciples, what a promise. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, the end of the age. What a promise. Man, woman, forsake each other more times. Friends, so-called friends, fur weather friends, they will forsake you in life's journey. You'll have many disappointments. But praise God, there's one who does not forsake his people. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. But the question is, are you in Christ? Does Christ belong to you? Do you belong to Christ? Is Christ preeminent in your life? Is he lordship in your life? You see, the Lord is always speaking to his people. There's a clear distinction between the people of God and people in their sin. God only looks at two types of people. People who are saved and Christ's sins forgiven and other ones who are still holding on to their sin. You either belong to God the Father or your Father is the devil. There's no in between. But Jesus has promised, I am with you always, the phone people, even to the end of the world. And even the Apostle Paul gives us that full assurance by expressing rejoicing in this, being confident of this very thing that God, He, which has begun to do His work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Lord is working on His people. We're all at different stages. In the process, progressive process of sanctification, some of us are more mature than others. Some of us have more grasp of scripture than others. But nevertheless, folks, God is working in every one of his people. We are part of his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on the good works. And the Lord will bring his people home to glory. Praise his name. Take comfort today that Christ is always with us, even unto the end of the war of the age. And he will bring us home to glory. And this is what this is a picture of. The Spirit of God had, had a, a, a comforting. He was moving upon the face of the waters. He was energizing it. Just like an eagle. It was like a picture of an eagle moving it over its young by protecting them. Who is this person in the curing? It's the Holy Spirit, it says in verse 2 C. The Holy Spirit was the one moving or hovering in his infinite energizing power over the waters. God's power never decreases or increases. God has all power and always will have all power. When Jesus was speaking to the woman of, of, of Samaria at the well about the living water, he could, he could give her which satisfies and never it runs out. <coughs> Jesus was referring to the Spirit of God, of course, being born of Cain of the Spirit, who energizes us, who quickens us, who regenerates us, who gives us newness of life, his life in Christ. But as many are led by the Spirit are the children of God, Paul says, but if you have the Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of Christ, you're not his. You see, God dwells, abides, he's baptized his people by a spirit into Christ. His life has entered our soul. Born again. What a miracle. The Spirit of God testifies of Christ. He reveals Christ more and more to his people. Without his dynamic supernatural energizing power we could not walk in the light bringing glory to the Lord 
The Spirit of God, of course, is the third person of the Godhead in which we are exhorted to be filled with on a daily basis. We're not waiting on this mystical experience to come down. We're called to be filled, singularly controlled. How do we be filled with the Spirit? Is being sensitive to the Spirit? Is by obeying God's Word? It is walking in faith and it is walking in the Spirit, not the flesh. We're called to be filled with the Spirit, not to quench the Spirit, not to grieve the Spirit. The Spirit is a person. The Spirit of God's office, of course, He has many different aspects to His office. He teaches us, He instructs us, He guides us, He empowers us, He energizes us, He convicts us, He gives, He prompts us. He gives us that desire to seek after the things of God. He reveals Christ more and more to us. He sanctifies us. There's many offices regarding the Holy Spirit, but here we identify He is part and involved in the creation process here. He always will glorify Christ. When Christ walked this earth, Christ glorified the Father. The Spirit's office is to glorify, point us to Christ. This again proves the Trinity of the Godhead as the Spirit of God was hovering, patrolling the waters here as he moved upon the face of the waters where tax houses today. God the Father spoke the world into existence, he mouthed within the existence, the creation, the universe and the being. God the Son made the creation. John 1 verse 3, Hebrews tells us, as other portions of Scripture tells us, by whom also he made the worlds. So God the Father spoke the creation in the universe, or the universe in the existence. God the Son made the creation. God the Holy Spirit moved, put into motion the creation process. Where was this place the Holy Spirit moved? It says upon the waters in verse 2 C. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The mass of earth material was covered with water at the beginning. It is interesting that the transmission of energy in the operations of the cosmos is in the form of waves. Waves are known for their rapid back and forth movements and a vibration, motion of a wave generator of some kind as energy cannot create itself. So it is appropriate that the first injection of energy to the universe was produced by the vibrating movement of the Holy Spirit upon the waters. Henry Morris, an incredible thinker, Regarding the book of Genesis, he says, As the outflowing energy from God's omnipresent Holy Spirit began to flow outward and to permeate the cosmos, the forces were activated on water and earth particles came together to form a great sphere moving through space. Other such particles would soon come together also to form sun, moon, stars throughout the universe. There was now a compass on the face of the deep, and the formless earth had assumed the beautiful form of a perfect sphere. It was now ready for light and heat and other forms of appealing energy. The creation needed also protection with the Holy Spirit. As the enemy, the destroyer Satan, would have delighted in messing up the material creation before it was perfected, as he would have attempted to fire the creation just the way he did in the Garden of Eden by deceiving Eve and the sin which resulted in the fallen world. Of course, there's another movement attributed to the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. 2 Peter 1 verse 21. It tells us for the prophecy, the word of God came not in old times by the word of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They were energy 
energized by the Spirit of God. They were superintended, inspired by the Spirit of God to write the Bible. This word move has the same meaning as it has in Genesis 1 verse 2 as the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God energized the primeval universe to bring form and life to God's creation. So over a period of approximately 1500 years, the Holy Spirit energized and inspired around 40 prophets 40 men from diverse backgrounds to write the scriptures to bring beauty and spiritual life to new creatures in Christ who are saved by his grace as the word of God empowered by the spirit of God sanctifies the people of God sets us free creates faith in us strengthens us instructs us encourages us teaches us directs us gives us wisdom, God's people on the righteous path for heaven. Just as the Holy Spirit brought order out of chaos at the beginning of creation, and beauty and fullness out of emptiness, so he can still perform this by transforming lives who you gave to him by taking a polluted, crushed, Racked sinner and must have sinned those. And changing them in the holy, righteous man or woman of God. Paul reminds us of any man being Christ, he is a new creature, all things are passed away, behold, all things become new. This is a wonderful transformation that God can do in a life. No matter how deep the sin you are, no matter how dark the sin you are. No matter how deep a hole you're in, God can transform your life, take you out of darkness, take you out of a life of mayhem and recklessness, a, a life of rebellion against God and of mercy and grace and transform you, regenerate you, give his life into your soul and make you into a holy, righteous man or woman of God. This is what the Spirit of God did. At the beginning of creation, <coughs> referring to the physical creation, the, the creation was chaos. He made it into beauty. It was empty, and he made it into fullness. And you know, Jesus Christ can take your life and transform you a life in which it's chaos. You see, sin destroys. Sin is reckless. Sin is rebellion against God. And folks, emptiness it is void. Solomon even said, if you have everything in the world and you're not in Christ, it is vomity and vomities. And this was the richest man probably in the planet at that time. God can transform you. God can give you life abundant. Christ can give you life abundant. Life fulfilling. Life well living, when near fulfillment and purpose. He can take your happiness and give you a life of abundance. What a saviour. There's been many myths started through the history of mankind. I'm nearly finished trying to explain the origin of the universe of mankind. In Israel's day, the pagan nations which surrounded them. Now they didn't have the light the way Israel had. Israel had the priesthood, did the temple, did the prophets, did the kings, did the word of God. The pagan nations didn't. And a lot of them surrounded Israel. Some believed in myths, thinking that monsters battled each other in the deep oceans and their false gods fought against each other in battles to bring the universe into being. But if only Israel would have shared the account of Genesis with them, with the surrounding nations around them, but because of their religious pride, they didn't. If only Israel would have shared the account of Genesis 
with the pagan nations around them, which presents God, the great designer, the only true God, the only creator, that he created all things and sustains all things because he's the sovereign ruler of this universe according to his power, his creation. You see, Israel were meant to be a light to the Gentile nations, but because of their pride, their religious pride, and their sin, and their rebellion, and their disobedience, they became, in a sense, a stumbling block. They were looking to be like the other nations, as they worshipped some of the idols of their pagan neighbours. Instead of paying close attention and applying what Moses said from the beginning regarding the Creator God in the universe, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth the truth forever. If Israel would only have brought them to that passage to tell them that there's a creator God. When Paul was ministering to the Greeks in Mars Hill in Athens, in Greece, to these great thinkers, he brought them to the creation first, and then he presented Christ to them. Praise God. God has given us his word. As you look up in the heavens, you should know there's a God out there. When you look around us, you should know there's a God out there. And ultimately, God has given us his most treasure, also of all, his word. Spiritual revelation, which points us to Jesus Christ. You see, God is a God of truth. God is a common keeping God. God is the one who made the heaven and the earth, the sun's houses, the sea, and all that is therein, which keepeth truth forever. There's only one way to God. There's many religions out there, over 4,000. There's only one true way to God, and it's through the person of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Have you come God's way in the person of Jesus Christ? Do you know your sins forgiven? Has your life been transformed? Has he taken the emptiness of your life, which sin does, and give you fulfillment and purpose which salvation does. Realizing why you're here on this earth is to glorify your Creator and enjoy Him forever and serve Him and know there's a place reserved in glory for you. Praise God for Jesus Christ. Praise God that He's a God who, even though we're born in sin, He's a God who transforms our lives and makes us new creatures, new creations in Jesus Christ. Dear friends, we'll look here at these two verses over the last number of weeks. This world is going to perish. We're talking about climate change constantly in the news. If we would only read the Bible, what is to happen? This earth is going to perish. The heavens even are going to be burned up in fervent heat. And God is going to usher in. Why is that happening? Why is it going to happen? It's because of sin. Because of man's rebellion against God. Sin has put a curse on us. Sin has put a curse on this world. That's why the creation groaneth. The creation groans for the new heavens and the new earth. This is why we die physically. And if you're in your sin and die without Christ, you will die spiritually. Which is the most important. You need to have your sins forgiven. You need to be a new creation you see. A new creature in Jesus Christ. To be prepared for death. Or be prepared for the Lord's return. Christ is returning. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you belong to him? This world folks is going to be. Bored up it says. With fire. And God is going to usher in the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, heaven, for his redeemed people, who are new creations in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new.
trust that is your experience in your life, knowing you're in Christ and Christ is in you and your sins have been cast away by his precious blood. The Lord bless the Lord to us this afternoon. We'll just sing our final hymn, 612, as we close our meeting. Today is 612. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross on Calvary. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. He belonged to the good shepherd, but he in the fold today. Threw his loving arms around me, threw me back into his way. 612, great words, and we'll stand please as we conclude our meeting.